Hello, everyone out there. This is uh, um, this is uh, Daniel Johnson from Venza, um, from our Dutch office. We're not not entirely true, but from my apartment near our Dutch office, uh, uh, welcoming you to this uh, this webinar. Um, we appreciate you coming and spending spending some time with us. Um, we've got uh, a, a range of experts here to to share some information. This is a new format that we've been trying out. Um, here at Venza, uh, with regards to our um, our webinars, try to keep it really brief, right to the point, and always making sure that it is uh, is peak value for you. And 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 the way we're doing that, we've got um, two gentlemen that are here as industry experts to shoot holes through the through the theories, uh, whatever is presented by um, by Stephen and and David today, and give uh, give their their unfiltered feedback on whether or not it is appropriate and uh and um uh, uh, yeah germane to the uh to the needs of hospitality so let's find out who our experts are um john do you mind uh, doing a, a, a quick introduction sure uh, my name is john burkhardt i'm with playa hotels and resorts uh and we operate 19 all-inclusive resorts uh, throughout uh, Mexico, Jamaica, and the Dominican Republic. Unfortunately, all currently shuttered. Um, but uh, we have roughly 9 to 10,000 rooms. Properties range in size from about 350 to close to 800 rooms. So uh, very, you know, complicated operations. Um, we do have the the uh, benefit of having IT staff on board at all the hotels. So we've got some some uh, uh, technology expertise locally as well as from the corporate side. Fantastic. Thank you so much, John, for uh, mm -hmm. taking some time out and, and being here with us. We very much appreciate that. Mark, uh, this is round two. The, the, the last time we had some technical difficulties, but mm -hmm. you're, you're, uh, you're you know, you're a good sport and uh, volunteered to come back again and see if we can uh, work out, work, if it could work out. And sure, surely is thus far. So yes. knock on wood. Yes. Uh, so, Mark, why don't you introduce yourself? OK, I'm Mark Pate with High Point Hotels. Uh, our corporate office is in Pensacola, but we have uh, hotels throughout the uh, Gulf Coast, unfortunately, hurricane zone. And uh, I'm the assistant controller and the IT uh, director. And in fact, this past Monday celebrated 31 years with High Point. So I tell people, I guess wow. it's a career now, not just a job. So I uh, <laughs> appreciate the, uh, the invite, uh, Daniel and the uh, Benza group. Really appreciate it. Fantastic. So you started when you were seven then? Seven, yes. Yes, just yeah, turned wow. seven. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Good to have you, Mark, as always. Um, so. Uh, the again how this is how this works out we're going to have uh, a brief presentation um the information is already on the screen and the presenters it's a it's a it's a two for one deal today um we've got uh, david and stephen um gentlemen why don't you uh, briefly introduce yourselves and then we'll just kind of launch right into uh, um uh what you've got david uh, I guess go first, uh, okay oh you go, go stephen <laughs> okay, my name is Stephen Guy. I'm the uh, managing director of our uh, of our managed services practice out of Pensacola. I, uh, I'm not an engineer, but I I'm, I'm around them a lot. So uh, <laughs> I'm actually responsible for talking to the customers uh, about these services, and and um, I'm neck deep into the pricing part of it and all that kind of stuff. So that's kind of my role here on this call. Not so much a technical role, but more of an experience role with what people are asking for and what we're working on behind the scenes to, to fill those requests. Very good. And uh, um, and added the extra great just for this uh, for this presentation to give you a little more distinguished look uh, in the beard. So thank you much <laughs> for that, Steve. <laughs> David, last but not least. Yep. David Christensen. I am the CIO of Vinza. Um, basically, everything Technical security, information security, all falls underneath me, um, and basically be presenting a lot of the uh, information here today. And just so I have something common to Stephen and Mark, I'm actually from Pensacola. Great place Thanks to be. Where the odd uh, guys out, John. <laughs> well, I live in Florida. Oh, oh you, there you go. There okay, you go. so I am I am the odd bubble. That makes sense. 
not the first time. It's <laughs> fantastic. Well, what you see on your screen, um, Mark and John, uh, can you confirm that you are you can see the uh, the the one pager? On yes. The yes. Okay. Very good. So again, this format we want to keep it concise. Anything we don't want no death by PowerPoint. This is a one pager kind of uh, kind of scenario with these new formats. Um, what you're seeing on the left hand side is uh, is reflecting to uh, some of the uh, presentations that that uh, David and I. Uh, uh, we used to talk about the, the must-haves, and um, I was looking through some of our old old materials and some presentations from 2018, and these these five were listed, and we thought, well, this would be an appropriate time to say, okay, what worked in the past, what was in the past, and now this we're in the we're in the midst of the crisis. What are we imagining in the post-COVID world will be the uh, must-have cybersecurity options? So, I'm shutting up. This is, I think, where David, uh, you'll, you'll step in, right? Most definitely. So the must-haves from last year or, or, or 2018 are still must-haves today, right? So definitely don't forget to use, uh, keep everything, your risk assessment, pen testing, all that. It's a must-have. you got to do it to be compliant. Most uh, standards and regulations, whether it's PCI, GDPR, this, the New York Shield, CCPA, all that stuff, right? So let's don't forget to do those items. But as we're going through the COVID and crisis and we're, we're talking to uh, – clients and uh, the information we're being asked a lot we're seeing a lot of on the right hand side the now is what should you do to be prepared for the next crisis or what should you start working on this crisis you know because uh and the news are talking about this is not the end of COVID-19 there can be more cycles right just like the flu it can be in the uh, last thing I've heard was maybe October another cycle of it so are we prepared for that and um, I'm going to talk about a couple of these items, and then Stephen's kind of deep dive in some of the areas as well uh, as we go through them. And definitely, Mark and John, speak up uh, at any time. Uh, cut me off, interrupt if you need to, because uh, I definitely want the uh, input from anyone. Um, so going into you know the post-COVID-19, uh, similar to the risk assessment, because the risk assessment is part of the BCP, BIA, DRP stuff. So that is your business continuity plans, business impact assessments, and disaster recovery. What we're finding today is there's a lot of check the box templated disaster recovery plans. I don't see many business continuity plans in the in our space. Uh, and really, I think what needs to come out of this is that organizations really need to take a hard look and an actual a positive step in doing it for real. Don't just check the box with the template. Go through the process. Do your risk assessments, uh, which basically. All that includes. So your business impact assessment for those on the call is you really need to look at your organization. What uh, assets of your organization are critical? So today uh, it's remote workers right now. Uh, it is your hardware to support that. It is your HR uh, because you got payroll changing. There's, there's furloughs going on. There's a lot happening right now. And if you don't know what those critical systems are, you don't know how to protect that. So that business impact assessment needs to be done. You may see it called business impact analysis, but it needs to be done so that you can do a risk assessment on those uh, critical assets to make sure that you can continue your business in this uh, in the scenario crisis like we have now and upcoming crisis, because this is probably not going to be the last one, uh, especially with the cycle coming on. And then based on that, the disaster recovery plan, once you have those assets uh, identified, how are you going to recover those if they go down? So Let's just say a scenario right now would be all of a sudden I've sent everyone home. I've got 100 employees. And my last bullet, which our honorable mission talks about the firewalls, we'll get into what happens if everyone's trying to remote into work. Firewall's not big enough. They crash. They can't do their business. Uh, we're doing call centers from home type of thing. And our hardware can't handle that. So for us, that's going to be a disaster, right? So we need to make sure that we, what is the backup plan for that? Uh, so definitely uh, bullet number one really is, to actually focus on it and not just check the box. Any any additional yeah. information or from you guys? No, that's that's definitely true. And I was just thinking about it as you were as you were talking. Um, we've been kind of fortunate in this in that actually two of our property accountants live in Texas, so we've had to put the infrastructure in for them to have the same experience as our accountants in-house. So that came as a real advantage when we had to get everybody else out of the building. We said, okay, we've got to do the same thing 
for Shelly and Cheryl that we've done for Shelly and Cheryl. So that was a having a little mm-hmm. bit of experience in that world was an yeah. advantage rather than just, you know, hey, what do we do? We've never had anybody outside this building. Um, so that that was a real advantage in our our experience uh, as mm-hmm. far as the change in the last three weeks. Yeah, and from my side, um, you know, similar to Mark, we're in we're in the hurricane zone, right? So yeah, we're in the Caribbean, exactly. Mexico. Um, we've dealt with hurricanes, so you know, business continuity planning is kind of ingrained in the business. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, but but not necessarily in this scenario, right? It's more it's been more about hurricanes and, and issues along like th- along that, along with you know potential. Um, uh, you know, ransomware attacks and other cybersecurity incidents. So, so designing um, plans around that. And I think as it relates to the disaster recovery plan, I think one of the things we've been really focusing on in the last couple of years is trying to build greater resiliency into our systems. Uh, you know, things like hybrid backup solutions, um, uh, you know, uh, where, where appropriate uh, hosting systems, not necessarily at the resorts, um, but not necessarily in our Florida location either, because again, we're in the hurricane zone. Right. So, uh, you know, a lot of thought has gone into to where we're putting systems, you know, but, but the big challenge in building that resiliency is, you know, getting access to the capital. We need to acquire the technologies to, to support that. Yeah, yeah, building that business case. Awesome. Um, so how do you guys want to do this? David, do you want to go through the other three items? Or, did, or Stephen, do you want to chime in and, and talk the uh, talk about the, the kind of the pricing? What how much is how much is right, you know, in budgeting? What what do you think is uh, is better? Should we uh, go through the list or? I think probably just talk- go through the list first and then I can kind of touch on some of the things that we're doing from a pricing perspective. Fantastic. Okay, dollars and cents. That'll that'll keep people listening. <laughs> to our All right. Very good. David, talk to me Definitely. about uh, yeah. talk to us about you, remote user. Yeah, I'll kind of lead lead off on this, and I'll let Stephen jump in at any time on it. So the remote user support, really, what we're talking about is in this case, this scenario, this crisis, everyone's working from home. So we've been approached quite a bit for companies that say, hey. I don't have the staff to support the issues that my remote users are having, right? So there's been MSP for on-site a lot of times for that help desk uh, support, but no one's prepared to support their at-home users. And a lot of companies, some of the uh, employees don't have a laptop. They're using their home computers. So now it's a whole new conundrum of, okay, I don't have an RMM agent on my employees' computers. How do I support them? So um, – I think there needs to be some investigation by companies going forward is if this happens again, it's one thing uh, support a little bit on my laptops and company owned, but what happens if they're working on a home computer because there's just no capital one to buy a laptop for everyone. So those that are critical uh, if they don't have it, but also it's just, I don't think most people are ready to have, you know, a staff of say 100 people working remote and having a help desk support. So I'm going to let Steven jump in a little bit. On this, well, that's kind of a, that's that's kind of it's got two sides to it, really. One, the, the scenario where the employee is at home working on their own computer, you know, there's some there are some things as a provider, uh, IT provider like us, for instance, that there's some liabilities with putting RMM agents on people's personal property. So, how can we be valuable to in that scenario? And the answer that we've come up with is, we will allow access to our help desk. For, for those devices, but we can't deploy our agents onto um, personal devices. The other, yeah. the other side of that is if it is a business computer and people are at home and they're working off of Wi-Fi and they've got pertinent information on their computers, you know, the scenario that we've come up with is let's deploy an RMM agent so we can monitor that computer. And then let's also put maybe a next generation endpoint detection and response um, solution on that on that computer so we can um, try to lock down ransomware and things of that nature that were that were mentioned earlier it's it's times like this um, for instance where these guys are trying harder than ever to hack into things they're trying to exploit yeah. um, people that are distraction you know, 
Yeah, absolutely, one hundred percent. So, um, in the in the remote employee situation, what we're trying to do for our people, what we're offering is, let's put a couple of agents on there at low cost. Let's 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 get the the laptop as secure as we can at the endpoint level, um, and try to and try to help in that way, if that makes sense. Yeah. Good. You kind of you kind of touched on email as well as the endpoint. Anything else to add on the email filtering and monitoring component? That's just another layer of security that makes sense. Um, you know, it it it's it makes a ton of sense. I, I was on a, a call yesterday with a um, a company that that actually writes the software for email security. And one of the things that we specifically touched on for hotels was, is there a way to intercept an, e an email that's coming in with a raw credit card data? I mean, for yeah. compliance reasons, not so much just security, but compliance. Yeah. Um, and the guy that I spoke with is an engineer for this particular company. He thinks it's doable and they're going to try to add it to their solution. So if a, if if I, for instance, am trying to book a hotel room for the month of June, and I put my credit, my personal credit card information in that email, this yeah. this system will search for that, flag it, and quarantine that email. So that's that's both a security measure and a compliance measure, and that's yeah. that's the kind of things that, that uh, we're trying to put together as well. Yeah, on, on average yeah, that, here that, in Europe, twenty percent of uh, of hotel bookings are done by email. Um, so it's it, there's there's uh, lots of groups are struggling to to make sure they segment those uh, those emails with the, the sensitive financial data. You're saying, David? Yeah, it, yeah. It's all like, uh, for instance, so he's talking to like a third party, another application that lies on top to to strengthen and work in tandem with like an Office 365. Because yeah. Office 365 does have its own DLP, which is data loss protection measures. It can look for data like this and stop it and block it. But mm -hmm. the some of the shortcomings of Office 365 is that it's, it's not very strong with the spam and email filtering at times. So that's why you have all yeah. these other MIME, CAST, and you have MailerSure, and ConnectWise has another one that uh, we kind of roll out too. So there's different options, but they're, 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 their strengths are that they really help stop this and use uh, online repositories of known actors, IP addresses, domains yeah. to help. Yeah. strengthen that and stop it. So they're using this huge infrastructure of all these different companies in a, in a database and data mining to determine if it is or not. And today, mm -hmm. with all the, with the COVID emails and in the U.S., the stimulus check emails, I mean, it, it, right now it's critical to stop that because everyone, every time they see an email, you're, you know, hit this link to, and we talked yeah. about this one, what? phishing with Corona yeah. last week. <laughs> Mike, oh, okay, I need to click this to check my status. Well, it's a, it's a phishing email. So we definitely, that email monitoring has to be in place, and if all Office 365 built-in features aren't going to do it, you may need to roll out a, another. And they're not that expensive, so we're talking about the numbers, but another yeah. added layer for that email protection is definitely going to be on top of your phishing stimulator, like we talked about before, will yeah. will suffice. It's interesting that you uh, you want to have these filters because there's also a kind of a human human resources optimization of your workforce by not having all these other things that are distracting them uh, when they're working mm -hmm. remote um, in these situations. All right, before we get to the numbers, lots of things shared. John, Mark, how is it, does, what, what Stephen and, and David shared, does it resonate with you guys? Are, are, you know, are, we, are, we, are we singing on the same sheet of, from the same sheet of paper or is it, uh, how is it with your world? Is it resonating? No, I, I, for us, it definitely is. In fact, we just, uh, within the last year, went to the Office 365 platform, but our former vendor that hosted our email was also the filtering, spam, and all that, and we actually stayed with them. So our email is actually delivered to them to do all of that magic stuff, and then it's handed off to Microsoft right. to actually publish it, and it's been a great, uh, great relationship. Uh, they're, they okay. they do a great job, and awesome. they that's how they made their uh, their name in the market. So definitely would agree with that. Yes. Yeah. How about you, John? I, and, it, well, my thoughts first on the remote user support and and COVID nineteen in particular really um, kind of uh, highlighted this issue. You know, for our corporate offices in the U.S., you know, we have roughly a hundred people. Everybody has a laptop. Um, about a quarter of the people worked remotely anyway. So corporate really wasn't an issue. 
you know, we just had to increase the number of uh, VPN connections we could support on our firewalls. And, you know, essentially people in the U.S. were able to go work from home. But in our regional offices and at our properties where, you know, we've, we've kept minimal staff on hand physically at the properties, but we have a number of people still working, but working remotely, we ran into a situation where we didn't necessarily have laptops and we had the IT teams actually going to people's houses with their desktop computers, monitors, et cetera, <laughs> getting them set up, making sure that they had an adequate uh, you know, connection, getting them connected to the VPN, et cetera. So it was a lot of work that went into that. And, and obviously, you know, kind of presents um, opportunities in the future to, to have a, another way of dealing with that. Um, and, and then as far as email filtering and monitoring goes, that we're Office 365 as well and have been for several years, but the addition of that additional level of security has been critical for us. Um, and not only, not only from the, you know, from the um, email filtering, but also, uh, you know, phishing, um, uh, uh, sensitivity to look out for those uh, those phishing emails uh, using artificial intelligence technologies and backups, archival of messages, et cetera. It's been a big plus. Very cool. Good. Thank you, guys. Um, so, Stephen, do you got do you uh, can you give us a summary on how much how much is right? What uh, uh, what can for for anyone looking for these solutions that doesn't Unlike the gentleman on the call that seem to seem to have already covered these bases, uh, for those that are looking and, and and identifying their budget in you know in the coming months, what's uh, what what is right? Well, it it really comes down to what do you want us to do? I mean, it, it, it there's the the tool cost is very nominal. Um, from okay. there, it's it's a matter of. Do, for instance, in the scenario that we've been talking about, remote workers that we need to keep secure, you know, our su suggestion was let's load an RMM agent, let's pay attention, let's be able to monitor that device, let's let's put a next generation antivirus on there to to have the artificial inter intelligence that can search for the ransomware and shut the device down if something was to uh, infect it. Um, outside of that, it, it go it, it it gets into a labor. Um, do you want us to okay. patch that system? I mean, if, if this person's at home for 90 days, you know, do they yeah. want us to do the patch um, yeah. or do they just want the tool? You know, so what we, what one of the programs that we put together in an effort to help our clients in a time of need, not at all a revenue generator for us, just say, hey, what can we do to help? We put together yeah. a program mm -hmm. for a scenario where someone would have a hundred employees at home We'd roll out an RMM agent. We'd put that next gen AV on, and we would allow up to a hundred support calls to our desk uh, for yep. a fee, a monthly fee that basically just covered our labor and our tool costs. We were giving it away, and it was something yep. like fifteen hundred dollars a month, you know, to have up to a hundred okay. service desk calls. You know, that that's that's kind of a pricing scenario, an emergency situation where yeah. People need help. Let's let's see what we can do to help them. Um, in a normal situation, it would be something like the RMM agent, a next gen AV, maybe even a, a, a email filtering layer, and then another layer that allows you to push policies and procedures to the endpoint through another agent. That tool yeah. set with the labor is going to fall somewhere in the you know twenty three dollar, twenty four dollar an endpoint per month total okay. including tools and labor okay okay so it's a scenario of do you just want the tool in an emergency situation or do you want the tool and the and the labor and that's the yes. differentiator in the cost okay. um, both of them are very affordable it, it, yep. it's just a matter of what 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 is your need at the time yeah okay what about the uh, the the first item the recovery uh, continuity planning I mean, of course, it's gonna, it's gonna, there's gonna be a range based on the sophistication mm -hmm. and the comp how complex the uh, the organization is. Um, you know, is it is it a number of hours? Is there a range that uh, that those that are listening can get get an idea? Just like what if I haven't got a plan? 
you know we're not in we're not in a hurricane zone so you know i we've not done that kind of work before from you know what what would what would be a ballpark well i would have to say if you've never done anything i mean just doing the business impact assessment because you've got to uncover every asset that you have in the organization talking to every yeah. department every department head trying to and, and what you should be doing for the privacy regulations anyway gdpr it's all about data mapping yeah. right where is right. my data? Yeah. Where is my information? Where are my assets? If you've never done that before, it is definitely a task. Um, the first year, first time is going to take, I mean, it could, I mean if with a team, I mean, it could take 40 hours. It could take 160 hours. I really don't know based yeah. on your organization. But uh, if you've never done it, it's going to take, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a job. Uh, if you've done it year in, year out, it's easier every year because all you're doing is verifying. Uh, and just verifying that the assets, the risk updating are still there new, new uh, and updating it. It's not hard. Yeah. Yeah, but I would definitely start out with, a, I would say, minimum 80 hours of someone really okay. dedicating their time to do it. Yep. It's 80 hours okay. of your of, of a, uh, an, an expert to help out, but also it's going to require some time up from, your, from your team because they have uh, – Yeah, I would start. Yeah. 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 So it'll yeah, and as long as it's based on the size of the corporation, how – you know, it's not uh, – to me, it's not how many properties you have. It's the corporation itself because – Hotel is a hotel is a hotel, but the organization uh, at the corporate level, it, they're going to have a lot more systems than even the hotel property itself yep. will have. Um, so definitely yep. it should be done, I, I would say, at the corporate level and then yep. push it down. You know, sure. uh, if anything's different at the uh, property level, uh, brand specific yep. or if it's an independent, we definitely need to customize for that. But usually most of the work, if you do a stamp generic hotel one, that should yep. cover at least 90 percent of your information yeah and of course there's there will there'll be some variations if you've got hotels that are um, the select service there's there are going to be fewer processings at, mm -hmm. at the hotel level right, right? so you've got if you've got a spa you've got F&B you've got you know a, yeah. a variety of other things at uh, at a resort um, then then you can have a little more processings but yeah the, the, those are just it, just slight variations. Okay. Exactly. Mark and John, what are your what are your thoughts with when, uh, with some of these numbers? So, from my my standpoint, on for us, the business impact assessment has been a pretty pretty big project, and 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 that's because um, you know we're working in different jurisdictions with different regulations. Um, uh, we, just the way we grew in terms of some, um, legacy systems, um, you know, that may present challenges, you know, when you, when you yeah. start looking at privacy issues and so forth. Um, so for us, it's been a, I'd say a month, you know, several months long process mm -hmm. and pulling all that information from each of our properties, again, handling it from a corporate, uh, standpoint, I totally agree with that. Because otherwise, you'll never come up with, you know, kind of the the standards if you try to yeah. do it from the ground up. You just yeah. won't get there. Yeah. And you got to prioritize, right? Especially mm -hmm. when thinking in terms of that data mapping and processing. Yeah. I mean, there's you know, some of the big processes. You've just got to do that because if you get into the minutiae right. too soon, it'll be. Uh, it'll yeah, just, and and it'll just and, be and we're dealing with task. two franchise organizations as well as. Your properties that we operate under independent flags, so it gets more and more complex. Sure. Yeah. Good. Mark, any 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 thoughts? Uh, um. Well, yeah, just just quickly, and as far as the corporate office, um, we had some pretty devastating hurricanes back in '04. Was Ivan and uh, '05, of course, was Katrina in our location. So we took the standpoint at that point, if it possible, try to get every application in the cloud. Uh, even you know, 15 years ago, and to date, we only have one application that's actually inside our building. So that's that's made our flexibility a lot better. Um, and so um, at, at the hotels, we're with two organizations uh, that are select service. So the mapping has been very easy on that side. We don't have spas, very limited food and beverage, and things like that. But everything you've said about the complexity and and getting the team on board definitely true and definitely you have to have the commitment to get it done and get it done yeah. correctly so yeah fully agree you have to have that 
Yeah, I have to from from up top. You've got to you've got to have the commitment and and make sure that everyone knows that it's important. Otherwise, those kinds of that kind of work just doesn't get done. Exactly. Yeah. Very good. Well, the plan is uh, with this with this visual is uh, we're gonna we're gonna flesh out flesh it out with Stephen and David's numbers. Um, some some things that you can act, uh, that that people can uh, uh, can use as kind of a, be a benchmark or a uh, you know, a, 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 you know, a starting point, and uh, and make that available for for download. Um, but we are at the uh, the uh, thirty minute mark. Just just after that, any parting comments? Uh, anything you're burning to share? Oh, start with the presenters. Uh, David, Stephen, anything that you wanted to say that that just didn't get a chance to get out? Yep, just one minute on the, the honorable mention. Uh, bigger firewalls, basically advanced firewalls. So I think, John, you mentioned earlier about uh, upping the VPN of some, of some of the firewalls. So the moment you start putting remote workers at a hotel and then now your home becomes a call center. So if you're taking uh, calls, if you're doing that at home for credit card information, now your home becomes a call center, right? So is your call center information or platforms Secured by VPN is it, so as it, everyone should be VPN in especially if there's any call center or any Credit card data being passed back and forth, which you shouldn't be doing anyway in the clear But receiving those calls. So if you are turning your home offices into call centers, definitely we need uh, Multi-factor authentication. So for those users on top of the VPN So they VPN in then they also should be multi-factor in so if you don't have firewalls that can one handle the low workload of remote users Definitely may have to invest into a bigger, better firewall, but also a more advanced firewall where if it doesn't have built-in VPN, so if you go to like a Forti uh, Gates, you get two uh, multi-factor tokens. That's it. And it's expensive to roll out tokens additional. So do you use a third-party VPN uh, on top of that that has multi-factor and all that stuff? So we definitely need to you know, look at that going forward. Is if this happens again, uh, are you out of compliance now because you're not doing it right? Uh, and, and now if you, I'd hate to have a breach because you have a remote worker, not VPN in with multi-factor authentication and the investigation shows that, right? So that's definitely, that's why we put that in there as an honorable mention. Very good. Steven? Uh, just to piggyback on that just a little bit. Um, to me, the key is just layers, layers and layers and layers of security. Um, and some pertain to, you know, just security in itself. Some help satisfy compliance at the same time. So the, the key to me is, is making sure you have layers of security that, that, have, that serve different functions. And um, if you can get there, then you've done just about all you can do. Very, very smart, very, very practical. Mark, John, anything to share? At the, um, I just uh, want to thank you guys. Let's get the grand finale. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thank you guys for the opportunity of participating in your webinars. Uh, we've known Venza for years. Uh, great group. And in the spirit of transparency, uh, we are with another vendor for compliance right now, but we are trying very hard to become part of the Venza group. We had a call this week, got another call next week. So we hope maybe next time we're on the webinar, we'll be part of the Venza family. <laughs> oh, that's that's fantastic! Thanks, Mark. Yeah, it's good news. Thank you, John. Anything? Uh, anything to share? Yeah, just my thoughts. I mean, I, I'll I'll, I'll um, echo Stephen's thoughts. I mean, the layers of security to me are, are critical. I think everything on on this slide um, has merit. Um, you know, the, the challenge is getting it funded, right? So, you know, from my perspective, mm -hmm. a couple of those on the right-hand side, the email filtering um, and the advanced malware endpoint protection, along with good next-generation firewalls are some of the cornerstones of uh, kind of our approach to security. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. We're five minutes over. For those of you that are out there in webinar land, thank you for uh, uh, for hanging with us uh, the last few last few minutes. We are going to. Uh, this has been recorded. We are going to post this. So uh, um, if you miss something, you can uh, um, you can see it out there on our web page, and um, and also down you'll have it access to a downloadable version of this uh, of this slide. Very good. 
everybody stay safe uh, and healthy out there and uh, thanks again for for being here for this webinar thank you thank Go you guys all right